Hi, I'm State Representative Jerry Knowles of the 124th Legislative District. I represent portions of Berks, Schuylkill, and Carbon Counties. I want to welcome you to my legislative report. Uh, most recently, I had the opportunity to sit and talk with Representative Valerie Gatiss. Uh, Representative Gatiss represents the 44th Legislative District, and that is uh, out in the area of the Pittsburgh Airport. I thought that you would enjoy, uh, sit back for the next half hour and you can listen to Representative Gatiss and I discuss the former House Bill 153, which uh, deals with reducing the size of the House of Representatives. I know that it was something that we talked about many times in the past, but uh, this would be a good tool to give you an update on exactly what Representative Gatiss and I are doing with the bill reducing the size of the House of Representatives. So welcome, Jerry. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, work with me as a new state legislator um, to sort of pass the, 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 uh, pass the baton on getting this issue moving forward. Valerie, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, you know, uh, I'm so happy that you've agreed. Uh, you came to me and we talked and uh, you had offered your support, and uh, you know I indicated to you that I thought it might be better if uh, if you might take over and 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 run with the bill as the prime sponsor. Uh, I appreciate that. You've you've got a lot of work ahead of you. Thank you. Uh, but I look forward to working with you. Well, I think uh, it's it's great to have someone with your experience in having done this because what what has been the process? A little bit of history, I think, would be really helpful to not only me but also to our constituents to know what it takes to actually get this piece of legislation, which is a constitutional amendment. It's not as simple as just passing a, a bill. So tell me a little bit about what the history has been and your experience in that. Well, the history has been that uh, it has to, as a constitutional amendment, it's got to pass in two consecutive sessions. Uh, and it has to be identical uh, legislation. So uh, yeah, it's a long I think uh, what, what I said was uh, during one of my floor remarks that it's a long and winding road. I believe that was the Beatles back in the <laughs> 70s. But uh, initially the bill was introduced. Uh, what year was that? That was in uh, 2015. That's okay. when the process started. Uh, at the time, there were 48 uh, people who signed on as co-sponsors, very enthusiastically signed on. And... Uh, the process, the process from that point was it, it had to be, it had to pass through the House, and then it was sent over to the Senate, and it had to, it had to pass in the Senate. But as you can imagine, nothing around here goes smoothly. So <laughs> I'm finding that yeah, out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it goes back and forth, and uh, and then after you know after it's passed by the House and the Senate, it has then, it has been yeah you know, we're on our way. We're on our way, uh, but then again, in the uh, in the next consecutive session, it and and, and that would have been the 2017 2018 session. Yes, that's session. correct. That's correct. But the thing is, uh, it's it's kind of funny because uh, initially, when the, and and by the way, uh, before I became the prime sponsor, this bill's prime sponsor was Speaker Sam Smith. So it goes before I got involved. It goes because. I think Sam may have uh, may have run with it, uh, you know, never got as far along as we did or I did. Well, I think that, you know, it's something like this, particularly a constitutional amendment, where you have to pass two legislative sessions consecutively before it even goes to referendum. Yep. And then, then there are requirements uh, after it passes that it has to be advertised in, in the media. I think it's one newspaper in every county, and there, there's a process that has to be followed there. Then... You go through the next session. And you know what, uh, Valerie, that's when it gets more difficult because uh, that's when people realize that, you know, this might happen. And it's amazing. Uh, well, you know, I, it's interesting because I, in, in studying all this, you and I had a lot of conversations, mm -hmm. but I put a chart together where I looked at who voted for the bill when it was introduced, who co-sponsored it, who voted for it, and then who co-sponsored it the second time and who voted for it or who didn't, and kind of did a comparison, saw people change their votes. Uh, I also saw, which 
I saw a, lot, a number of members who are no longer here, so you can't kind of go back and say, hey, wait, you voted for it before. Now are you going to vote for it again? So I see that the process is complicated, but it really enables me to look at who in this session or who we have now in, in, in this, uh, this two-year legislative session are the same people, and I'd like to try to get them on board and, uh, and to, to not only co-sponsor the bill, but also vote for it. So t let's talk a little bit about what is the benefit of reducing the size of the legislature. Because well, we, we've heard a lot of pros and cons, uh, but I'd like to hear from you what, you know, what your experience is. Well, I've heard it all. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the, the, there are some savings. You know, there are some savings. It's and almost, what, 15? 15, 15, 15 million. 15 yeah. million a year. Yeah, which is a lot of money. But, uh, you know, some of the arguments that I heard that in the big scheme of things, when we're talking about 34, $32 billion budgets, uh, it's not a lot. But it's a lot of money where you and I come from. But I you think. know what? All of us have to tighten our belt. And it begins with a lot of these smaller things, so to speak, that, uh, that we can cut our costs. You know, that cup of coffee that you have every day and go to the store and buy, maybe, you know, you, that, that adds up after a while. So I think all these things that we can chip away that might not affect a lot of people, uh, but could actually result in huge savings. And that's something that, uh, that when I got elected that I have stressed fiscal accountability, uh, savings, just being prudent in the decisions that we make every day. Valerie, it comes down to leading by example. Leading by we, example. We, we talked to everybody else about how they should tighten their belts. And, I mean, there, there, there was a savings of, uh, of around $15 million a year. Uh, but just as importantly, uh, the, the fact that, and you've got to be careful how you say this, but as you know, uh, you know we, we've got 203 members. And it is much more difficult to build consensus when you're dealing with 200 and you know with 203 people, it, 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 I got that right. No, it's, so there's two. Yes, yeah, so there's 203 seats, yeah. and I know people have said to me that, well, but if there's fewer seats, then then that means more constituents per per seat, and your state representative won't be able to reach out to folks. But keep in mind that 203 members that has been for a very long time, mm -hmm. and we now have new technology. We can reach out to our constituents much faster, better than we ever have been before. So I think using technology to our advantage can help us save money. But um, with 203 seats, like you said, it is really difficult to get consensus, uh, particularly when the bills move so quickly. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to uh, talk to a number of your colleagues when a legislation, a piece of legislation is before us. But to talk to 203, it's almost impossible uh, to, to, to get everybody on the same page. Yeah, and really, we can, we can talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. I mean, the good, if we want to talk about the good, the, the good is that we reduce the size of government. We go from 203 to 151. And it's, i, I got to tell you a quick story because I find this rather humorous. humorous. Uh, when, when it had gone through committee, a state government committee, it was House Bill 153 because it was supposed to go from 203 to 153. But what happened was we had uh, realized that during the Constitutional Convention back in the 60s, the goal that they had set was that there were going to be 203 House seats in the Commonwealth. Now, bear in mind that back in those days, we didn't have the computers, we didn't have the technology that we do today. So this is a story that was told by uh, someone that was involved in that process. And basically what happened was they were drawing up the districts, they were setting everything up. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and they counted, and it wasn't 201, it was 203. <laughs> so they said, hell, I'm tired, we're going to bed. So that's how it got to be 203. So uh, Representative Metcalf in committee thought, that it would be an opportunity to correct that mistake. To, you know, it was supposed to be 201, so we can get it down to 151. So in committee, uh, the, the chairman in the first, in the first session, uh, he put an amendment in, and that was fine with me. You know, because people, uh, pe you know, you know, people have talked about where did we ever come up with the number. We can talk, uh, talk about that a little later. I, I, I don't want to cut you so, off here. In terms so, no, of so, so access to your state state legislator, 
uh, if you have 203 versus, or you have 151 versus 203, uh, the, the, really, the question that comes up is, well, but if we have fewer legislators, that, does that mean that, that they will be influenced, it'll be easier for people who are of high influence to influence them? Uh, my view of this is that it makes it more accessible to the average person to be influential Whereas with 203, the average person cannot be influential because you've, you as a constituent or people as constituents have to get to 203 members, whereas it is much more efficient for the average person uh, to be able to contact their legislator and actually make a difference. And, and one of the things that I'll tell you, Valerie, is uh, at no time was, uh, was I thinking that, well, I, I, I said in different interviews, I don't want another. I don't want another Senate here. You know, and what do you mean by that? Well, by, I, I think that the, there's 50 senators, and some of the uh, some of the games that were played during uh, during this whole process were uh, they they tried uh, they wanted to reduce the Senate from like 50 to 37, 38, and I quite and, frankly, and they meaning other House members. Oh yeah, yeah. There were all kinds of shenanigans that were pulled, uh, <laughs> and I and I quite frankly said. Uh, I'm not looking to create another Senate. I'm okay with 50 senators. You know, they, they represent about a quarter of a million people. I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, the bill, uh, we represent somewhere between 62 and 65,000. I, I think the bill would have taken it up to like 83. It, it goes up to 80, 80 yeah. some thousand, which, which we are the second highest uh, number of legislators in uh, the nation, mm -hmm. and we are in session all year round, which also adds to those expenses. The um, when when you look at the number of constituents represented uh, per legislator in other states, mm -hmm. it is anywhere between eighty mm -hmm. and a hundred thousand. Some of them are a little bit higher, uh, a couple of them are a little bit lower, but they also compensate by only meeting uh, either six months out of the year or every other year. So you almost can't compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges here. Uh, but we can look and say the number one issue with us here in Pennsylvania is that we have uh, the highest paid legislature, second highest paid legislature in the nation. We have um, other per diems, benefits, et cetera. Not that I would say that people don't deserve to get paid to do a job here, but when you combine all of these together, uh, it's, um, it's probably, you know, it just a, a, it's, there's, a, there's some handsome compensation, although we do work long hours. Uh, this is something that could actually bring, in my opinion, uh, bring, bring the power back to the people. Valerie, you, you, you mentioned something. Uh, we are the second largest legislature in the United States. We are the first full-time, the largest full-time full -time. legislature. So we're largest and full-time, yeah. Uh, well, I think we're second largest uh, uh, I, oh gosh! I Somewhere around, I think I think that's correct. It, yeah. But but the, but when you combine both being the second largest yeah. and yeah. the full time, yeah. it really does add up expenses for for the, the the Commonwealth. And and the question that I was asked, and I started to go there before, you know, people said, well, where where did you come up with the number? And uh, I I have uh, Pennsylvania, the population around twelve oh, twelve point eight. I think we may be over thirteen million now. Uh, we would be going to 151. You would represent 84,000 people. Illinois is a is a good state to use as a comparison. They're around 12.8 million. They have 118 House members. They represent 109,000 people. New York, uh, they've got about 19.8 million. They have 150 reps. Uh, they represent somewhere around 129,000. Michigan. A little shy of 10 million, uh, they have 110 state reps, and they have, uh, or, uh, I think, like they represent 90,000 people. And lastly, the state of Texas, you know, they've got uh, close to 28 million people. They have 150 reps, and they represent around 168,000 people. So we are going to that number 151 is very reasonable, and there's there's many ways that you can substantiate the reason to go there. So, so we've talked about the history. Now, going forward, uh, you and I have talked about this, that we teamed up. I want to take the baton. I've introduced the legislation uh, that has been introduced, and uh, it's uh, Senate Bill, or excuse me, it's House Bill uh, 2151. Right. And um, so that has been introduced, and what's the process going forward, and where can people 
uh, constituents uh, help in sort of pushing this issue and pushing it with their state legislator, not just us. I mean, well, we know we're I, champions. And, and I will say to you, Valerie, that you, your challenge is, is going to be even more difficult than mine. Uh, I will tell you that, uh, you know, when, when you put uh, two sessions or four years into something, and when you get, no one has ever got, we got one vote away. We got, and then there were some tactics that were pulled in committee, and you know how that stuff works around here. That somebody put, right, put an amendment in, and then and it had to go yeah, back yeah, for yeah, concurrence. Yeah. And, and they blew it up, and, and that's what some of them, because some of them, and, and I, yeah, there's a lot of good people around here. We work, we're very fortunate to represent the people that we do. There's a lot of good people, but sometimes people like to play games. But so, that doesn't mean we're not going to try. Oh, no, that's you're good, but that's you're, the thing is we, exactly. we, we need to keep this out in the open right. to let people know that there are people fighting for it. And there are a number of, of folks who have signed on this piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. So we just need to make sure that any of those uh, uh, individuals who are coming into the legislature, that the general public is pushing their legislator to say, hey, look, you know, we elected you, but we elected you to represent us and, and reduce that size of the legislature. Valerie, what, what I would say, and, and I tell people this all the time, when, when people would come up to me and they said that they supported House Bill 153, I would say, well, uh, where do you live? And they say, well, I live, uh, uh, you know, I live out around Pittsburgh. Uh, and your district number, forgive me. It's 44. So they said, yeah, I'm, I'm out around Pittsburgh. Uh, who's your state rep? Well, Valerie Gaines, and I say, let me tell you something you're going to have a lot more influence over Valerie Gatiss than I am. So what you need to do, you need to call Valerie, and you need to tell her that you believe this is good legislation and ask her or him to sign on. Because that's, that's how this is going to happen. And, and we, I said it was going to, it's going to be more difficult because I think every time you try something difficult, it becomes more difficult. On the other hand, <laughs> there are some new faces around here. We have a lot of new faces. And there are people who I will tell you were very helpful and very supportive of me through this process. I had good people helping me. Well, I, I'm very optimistic because I think that uh, my freshman class, if you will, the class of, of legislators who came in on both the Democrat and the Republican side, uh, seem to have a number of years of experience in the private sector or doing a number of, uh, of, of jobs that, that give them a life experience. And I'm really optimistic that they are really coming in here to, to fight for their constituents. So, um, I mean, what, what you're going to hear, Valerie, I can tell you what you're going to hear. I've heard it all. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, you are going to hear that, oh, there's no way that I can represent 80 some thousand people. And my response to that was, uh, listen, we've got, I, I mean, we've got iPhones, iPads, we've got all these devices, all Agree. these, uh, we've got social media. We've got, you know, we've got a, a, a system in place. It's much easier for people to contact you than it was 20 or 30 years ago. It sure is. It's much easier. The, the, uh, the other argument that was said to me is that, uh, well, then you'll be pitting, uh, let's say if you do consolidate, and by the way, this legislation would take place in 2030. So it would right. be the 2030 cons uh, census. Uh, that means that's 10 years from here. Uh, you know, Valerie, that might make it easier for you. You know, you know why? <laughs> why? Well, because, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the argument was mine would have taken effect during, after I've, the census. Well, now... Uh, that is yeah. the one thing that we did differently, so that when people said, well, they didn't want to eliminate their own seat. Exactly. Well, now it's 10 years down, down the road. Yeah. Uh, how about consolidate? But the other question was uh, that if, uh, if we do consolidate in the t after the 2030, and let's say this passes, that they said it would pit legislator against legislator. And I said, bring it on, because if I'm doing a good job, yeah. that actually gives constituents the opportunity to match uh, legislators head to head and say, hey, who's, who's done the better job when given the same sort of opportunity in the seat? So I say go for it. What, one, of the, one of the most humorous uh, incidents that I saw was in a committee, meeting, a committee meeting. I had a member who represents the rural areas, and he said, this is going to hurt rural Pennsylvania. Shortly thereafter, at that same hearing, there was a city legislator who set up and or sat up and said, "I can't vote for this. This is bad for the city of Philadelphia." So I thought, you know, it, yeah. it, it's a, proportionately, 
you know, the, the, the districts will be reduced. I mean, I, they make it sound like one or well, the other. Exactly, proportionally. And in fact, uh, one of the other arguments that was said to me that it would reduce uh, the opportunities for women and minorities. I don't see how that's possible. When you consolidate districts, if anything, you will consolidate and have greater consensus, whether it be women or minorities, because you'll have a higher number of folks uh, voting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've, I've heard all sorts of arguments. And, oh, the other one is uh, the person who introduces it, there will be the first seat that's eliminated. Well, you know what? People elected me to do my job, and if doing my job gets me unelected, I guess that's, uh, you know, that's, that's what they elected me to do. Valerie, I will tell you that the, uh, I had one member, and no names, <laughs> but I had one member who uh, came to me in the, and by the way, uh, they're not here anymore, but, uh, but anyway, he came to me, they came to me and they said, uh, so are you really going to run, are you really going to go with this thing? And I looked at the co-sponsorship memo and I said, you're a co-sponsor. <laughs> and they said, yeah, but I never really thought it would get this far. So that's the kind of games that you're dealing with. Right. And we need to hold people's feet to the fire. We and, need to hold them to the fire. You're absolutely right. And people think that if somebody co-sponsors something that they are definitely committed to it. But it's like anything else. You know, actions are greater than words. I want to see them advocating for it. Let uh, me tell you the most important element, and you've got to remember this, because... We have a tendency to get involved in the stuff that we're talking about here, okay? Let me tell you something that we got to remember. This is a constitutional, it's an amendment to the Constitution. So guess who gets to make the final decision? The people the of people. Pennsylvania. So basically, you know, my, you know, when I was selling this bill, I said, look, let's give the people of Pennsylvania the, the chance to decide whether we should be at 203 or 151. People deserve the right to make the decision. And that's been my sell all along. You know, and they said, well, you know, uh, well, well, you know they're going to want to make it smaller. Well, I said, maybe that's the answer to your question. <laughs> but I said, realize that from the time this, when, when it finally passes, this is not signed by the governor. The governor has nothing to do with this. You will have an opportunity during that period of time, both sides of the issue, those who believe we should stay at 203 and those who believe that we should go to 151, you will have an opportunity to make your sales pitch to the voters of Pennsylvania, and then they get to make the decision. So, so Jerry, what is that opportunity, and how do we take the opportunity that we have right now and move and advance the ball on this? Well, the opportunity, we need to remember that this is a difficult chask, or task. But I know that you uh, are, the guy, are the lady the lady that can do it. Uh, it, it it's tough. I, I mean, we, we need to uh, continue to educate our colleagues. And, and, and constituents. Oh, yeah. But, but even our colleagues. It, it's amazing uh, when I would sit down and talk to people. And, and uh, they were on the, you know, they, they were kind of... Uh, and I would explain to them why this is good for Pennsylvania. I would explain to them that the voters get to make the choice. The voter gets to make uh, the yeah, choice. Yeah, and there were and there were uh, there were some of them who came over and uh, who eventually ended up voting. If you remember, Valerie, I know you don't remember. I guess you weren't <laughs> here. But this was a uh, this was a back and forth. Uh, it, it it was very very grueling and challenging, and uh, I look forward to it. I, I look forward to doing it all over again. But we, we do, I've already seen you work on the floor. I've already seen you approaching members, asking them if they're going to sign back on. And uh, I, I think we continue to build our, our co-sponsorship uh, memo. Uh, we, we need to certainly be uh, constantly in contact with leadership, uh, letting them know how important this is to us, uh, encouraging the leaders to uh, uh, don't forget we're here and we're not going away. That's right. You know, I, we're not going away, and I think that there are a number of other legislators who feel the same way. And as you said, we're just we're we're talking to our colleagues. We are getting the number of, uh, of co-sponsors. Uh, we're talking to leadership, and uh, you know, it's one day at a time. But we're going to keep this in the news, and uh, we're going to make sure that we work our our colleagues. But I I absolutely appreciate the work you have done, the history. It's been very helpful to me, and it's been an absolute honor to 
uh, work with you and team with you in order to do this. The um, Valerie, when you when you think about uh, this process, I mean, our ancestors were were so brilliant. I, I mean, uh, the, I, I had an old timer that one time I said to him when I was county commissioner that that we need to run government more like a business, and he said to me, I won't tell I won't tell you the expli the ex <laughs> expletives, but it was like. How can you be so dumb? Government is is not supposed to be run like a business. There 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 are checks and balances, and you know they. Uh, that, what, listen, think about it, Barry. The checks and balances should be run like a business. Yeah, but yeah. you know we all know that government does take care of the people. But we need to have the combination of both uh, government and the, the business aspect mm -hmm. of things in order to make sure that we're using tax dollars wisely. But to pass a bill, not easy. I mean, people, there are thousands of bills that are introduced in the Senate and the House, and how many of them really become law? They, did, they, they didn't want to make it easy. <laughs> they wanted to make it tough. When, when you go through the process and you go from the House to the Senate and you make changes and you have concurrence, when you're doing a change to the Constitution, it is tough. It is a challenge. That's not, that's not by mistake. They wanted it to be tough. They thought they had a good product. They wanted it to be tough. Yeah, well, that's, and that's, you know, I certainly encourage people to read the Constitution, know that both the Pennsylvania Constitution and the U.S. Constitution, but I absolutely agree that our founding fathers were brilliant. So I don't mind fighting this fight because I think that um, with uh, 203 members, uh, we, we represent people. But I think we can do it much more efficiently, and I'm I'm pleased to champion this uh, this uh, this issue and take your baton and uh, move it forward. Well, you know anything that I can do to work with you, I'd be more than happy to. I would like nothing more than to see the the voters of Pennsylvania get the opportunity to make this uh, to make this choice. Well, I, I've been keeping a, a list of those who have, as I said, I've put a chart together. Those who have sponsored it those who have voted for it, those who have voted for it twice. And, uh, and of course, you know, we've got a, n a number of new members, so we've got to approach them, talk to them. And I think that's the process going forward. I'm, I'm certainly honored to be working with you on this and appreciate all your history, your background. Uh, I think this has been really helpful to me. And uh, I look forward to representing the people of the, um, you know, of not only my 44th district, but also uh, of the state of Pennsylvania. I think that, that the history behind this is absolutely fascinating, and I, I certainly encourage a number of individuals to, uh, to understand the Constitution. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed the last half hour. If you have any questions, you can call my, one of my district offices or my Harrisburg office. Those numbers will be available to you on the screen shortly. So again, thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you the next time on Legislative Report.